why have they suddenly gotten behind it? They're not just letting it happen, but it's big corporate money that's actually pushing for legalization. You're listening to The Corbett Report. Welcome, friends. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com in a conversation that's coming to you uh, on the 6th of July, 2015, here in Japan. 2016. Wow, I'm still getting the date wrong. Mark it on your calendar, friends. We're more than halfway through the year, and I'm still calling it 2015. It is 2016, and today we're talking to a good friend and a guest that has been on The Corbett Report many times in the past. That is Ellen Brown, the author of Web of Debt and The Public Banking Solution. She writes at the Web of Debt blog on ellenbrown.com. Link in the show notes, as always. And today we're going to be talking about perhaps a different subject than we usually talk to Ellen Brown about. Uh, she wrote a, uh, a very interesting two-part article uh, on the War on Weed, which I will direct your attention to. And, well, Ellen Brown, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, thanks, James. It's great to talk to you. All right. Well, I want to talk about this War on Weed article that you've written because I think it is obviously something that is important to a lot of people in the current American political context where we do see this move towards not just decriminalization, but legalization of marijuana for recreational purposes. And this is a sea change that's been taking place over, well, I mean, decades, I suppose, but specifically in the last few years, really gaining momentum. And there's one sense in which, of course, this is a good thing, the freedom that people are having to do things that they want with their own body. But there is also a second side to this that you explore in this article that I think is important to get on the table. And this relates back to how this entire battle over the criminalization or legalization of weed can come back down to the corporate interests and whose interests this is really in. So let's uh, just take this from the opening of your article where you write, The war on cannabis that began in the 1930s seems to be coming to an end. Research shows that this natural plant, rather than posing a deadly danger to health, has a wide range of therapeutic benefits. But skeptics question the sudden push for legalization, which is largely funded by wealthy investors linked to Big Ag and Big Pharma. All right, so to set the table for the conversation about what's happening right now, perhaps we should go back and understand the context of this. Why was marijuana and its all of its derivatives, including industrial hemp, made illegal and made into a Category 1 controlled substance in the first place? Was it out of a genuine fear of public safety, or were there other interests behind that move? Well, there were clearly other interests behind the move. It was, for the American colonists, it was the most, I think it was the first uh, agricultural crop that, that they had, hemp. And it was like your patriotic duty to grow hemp. Hemp was used as money. It was actually currency in the colonies. And it had many, many uses all the way up till the late 19th century. It was one of the most important agricultural crops. One thing you had to have it for was sales for a ship. So if you had any kind of shipping business, you, you had to have hemp. And of course, it was for cloth and uh, textiles of various sorts. It's uh, more efficient as a as a paper than than growing wood, and there are, they keep coming up with new uses for it. And also, it's been used for its therapeutic benefits for two thousand years. I mean, there's at least the records go back that far. It may be one of the oldest therapeutic herbs. And there's just the fact that it's a plant. I mean, it's called a drug, but it's a plant. We're talking about a thing with roots and leaves. And to criminalize a plant seems like a non-starter. So um, in the 1930s, it was competing with a number of other uh, businesses, including the pharmaceutical, the oil, pet, uh, the, oil the paper, the um, They were coming out with these new synthetic materials that hemp would compete with. And uh, there was a a big problem with immigration that um, in California, where right now is, you know, probably maybe the the hub of where they grow uh, medical marijuana. In California, you had all these Mexicans coming up over the border, and this was part of their culture to smoke marijuana. It, in fact, it was given a different name. It, it was cannabis when it was part of these natural remedies that all doctors were familiar with, and they changed the name to marijuana, um, meaning this happy drug, you know, that that was the, the Mexican name for it. And 
it was said to make women willing to sleep with black people. <laughs> Amazing claims were made for it. So, so it was an excuse to um, throw immigrants in jail, black, blacks and Mexicans. And um, it, out of that came this whole big criminal business that, that we now have. And then, so, so it was, it was made illegal in the 1930s. And then under uh, Nixon with the war on drugs, it was made um, a schedule one controlled substance, which meant it was a deadly, dangerous drug with no um, therapeutic benefit and um, subject to abuse, which is clearly not true. It has lots of therapeutic benefit. One of its big benefits is uh, for cancer, which is the biggest uh, big business in the U.S. right now. So it clearly competes with these drug businesses. So why, that's the question, why all of a sudden, if if in fact it was big corporate money that was suppressing it, why have they suddenly gotten behind it? They're not just letting it happen, but it's big corporate money that's actually pushing for legalization. And particularly, it's George Soros, and the um, uh, who is a big shareholder in Monsanto. And Monsanto just, Monsanto and Bayer are in negotiation for Bayer to buy out Monsanto. So we're talking big ag and big pharma who would like to take over this very large multi-billion dollar business. And the only way they would be able to do it, clearly, would be to um, impose pharmaceutical regulation on on this alleged drug and uh, make it genetically modified so that, I mean, we know what gen- GMOs have done to corn and soy, and that's that's what they want to do to marijuana. And there's research going on in Uruguay, et cetera. One problem, that, one reason that ha- it hasn't been legalized for um, medical purposes is um, federally is that you have to do these very expensive j- studies and uh, that go through the FDA. And nobody, nobody, of course, has been able to afford to afford to do that or has the profit motive to do it except big drug companies and if they do it they want to patent it and they want to make it genetically modified so walk us through what the 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 business plan is here um explain for people how it is that making something legal can be done in such a way as to benefit the big corporations uh, right now in California, it's uh, legal for people who have health problems, and you can go to a doctor of your choice and get a um, um, permit of, that says you know you're you're allowed to use it, and then you can grow it in your own backyard or wherever you like. And um, but the rules say that it can't be grown for profit. In other words, you can have these little dispensaries that that are nonprofits that you can pay the people for the work that they do, but you can't have corporate shareholders who are sucking profits out, who are not actually workers in the business. So that forecloses uh, Monsanto, Big Ag, and um, Bayer, and Big Big the big pharmaceutical companies. So the way for them to get in is to um, legalize it, which is what what the current bill is in California. That's what prompted me to write. Um, There's a bill that's uh, coming up in November. Uh, We had a bill that was passed in, I think, in the the 1990s, which was the uh, Compassionate Use Act, I think it was... um, 215 was the number on it. And um, that was the one that allowed uh, use for medical purposes if you got a permit from your doctor. And, but it, and it was a, um, an initiative of the, of the voters. So then there was a legislative bill passed that put all sorts of uh, pharmaceutical restrictions on it. And 
the problem with that is it was a it was a legislative bill, which technically you can't override a voter initiative by the legislature. What you need is another voter initiative. So now there's another voter initiative pending that would incorporate the the legislative uh, act that was already passed, I think, in uh, last December of 2015. So that's what that's what they're trying to do is to. It, it looks like they're legalizing it for all purposes, but in fact, you have to be over 21. So you know that there are going to be all sorts of teenagers who are sneaking around in the black market who will get caught, who will wind up in prison as they are today. So you've still got big business for the prison industry. Um, even people who are not um or people who are over 21 will still have a problem if they're, well, you know that a lot of users may not qualify for the um, technical, they may not have the sort of health problem that they're, that the doctor that they're assigned to says qualifies for, for medical use. And they may not want to take these drugs that are actually made pharmaceutically that are GMO, they could be GMO. They're um, they for sure they've been extracted. They're not the whole plant with the whole whatever the whole therapeutic benefit. I mean, anybody who's into holistic medicine wants the whole plant. You can I I saw a video of people who were juicing the plant and got amazing. I mean, it was amazing the things, the health problems that these. Juicing the plant, the raw plant, you're not smoking it, you're not getting any sort of high off it, you're not heating it, uh, it has amazing health benefits. And clearly you need a lot of plants to do that. You can't just have an, whatever the very limited amount that you're allowed to grow yourself. And if you have a serious disease like MS or cancer, you're going to, you would need a lot of plants, so... Well, I think the uh, the real agenda here is exposed even on the official website for the Proposition 64, Yes on 64 campaign, uh, Support the Adult Use of Marijuana Act at let's get it right, CA.org, which says uh, the statewide ballot measure to control, regulate, and tax adult use of marijuana will take a grassroots movement to be a part of it right away. Um, I think control, regulate, and tax are the key uh, words there um, rather than legalize. So perhaps legalize is not quite the right word to be using in this context. Um, but this, right. please go the, ahead. I say about the taxes will not go to help the, the the state in any way, like the schools, all the things that we need tax money for. It's going to go right into this business of control. So it will go back into law enforcement administration of the program itself. So and, it's all uh, my regulatory agencies, which have a history of being tied to the very corporations that they're supposedly regulating, um, as we've seen in all too many sectors of uh, the American industry and economy. So uh, that presents us with the conundrum for people who are interested in the legalization of marijuana in California. Should they be voting no on 64? And if so, what, what should they be doing positively? Yes, they should be voting no on 64. And there there was um, an original bill. It's the Jack Herrera bill. I don't know the number on it. But there are ways that you could legalize it for everybody that would be safe and fair and not under the control of big corporations. So the, uh, the answer is to reject the phony solution and work towards what the real solution is, although obviously there is not the big corporate money and interest and passion behind the real That's solution, true. as always. All right. Well, um, thank you for bringing this to our attention. I think it is important, especially for people in California, but for people around the United States and elsewhere that, is fa that are facing similar issues right now. It's not just a question of legalization is a question of how it is legalized and the framework in which that occurs. All right, let's direct people once again to ellenbrown.com where they can find more of your work as well as the articles that we've discussed here. Ellen, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Jim. The Corbett Report presents Laughing at Tyrants, the latest DVD from the producer of on the morning of September 11, 2001, 19 men armed with box cutters directed by a man on dialysis in a cave fortress halfway around the world. And... Well, today on the How To Podcast, we tell you how to foil your own terror plot. And... But that's called the death panel, uh, and you're not supposed to have that discussion. Shut up. 
conspiracy theorist. 12 of the funniest Corbett Report videos on one video DVD. Buy one for yourself or share it with a friend. Because the best way to disarm a dictator is to laugh at him. Buy your copy today at corbettreport.com slash shop.